Did well. Yeah. Now, Frank, where's the cigar? Uh, it's hidden. It's hidden. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but it's it's here. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> Still Cuban Those, cigars. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when they're available, yes. Okay. Well, let me start with a very current topic. You, uh, not uh, just a while ago, you got a very important prize. I think it's called the National Arts Medal of the United States, Correct. and was handed over to you by the man who's now trying to get president the second time, right? Well, the man who should be president again. <laughs> <laughs> What do you say? What are the chances that he's coming the next time? Uh, it depends what algorithm you've used. But um, <laughs> according to the mathematicians, uh, he's ahead right now, but uh, it doesn't mean much. OK. So you're rather optimistic, or? Yes, I'm more optimistic than it appears, yes. OK. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you, in a way, uh, are you uh, in the campaign? I remember four years ago there were several artists who tried to support Obama, uh, and uh, there are several artists uh, who, who try now to support him. Are you one of them? I'm not sure what you're saying. I mean, I've always supported Obama, and I'm pretty much a lifelong Democrat, and I'm going to die one. Okay. But um, but that's I, not really the issue. I mean, uh, artists are a are asked periodically and actually in a fairly methodical way uh, to, to support uh, political candidates. Right. And they respond uh, pretty well, actually. Mm -hmm. But it, it's hard to know. Um, I don't know. I heard a rumor of how heavily uh, I supported Obama financially, which is not possible, actually. But I, <laughs> <laughs> I would like to have. Okay. But uh, it's not. Uh, uh, it's a strange. Rumors really do. Pro proliferate and grow, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. but you don't do something like campaign uh, posters or something like that? No, no I it's mean, it, if of... for a simple reason that it would be disastrous for the candidate, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, that brings me to the question of social responsibility mm -hmm. and the political aspects in your work. Is there something like political aspects, would you say, or is it art about color about space. Well, it's art different. about art, and uh, art and politics, you know, you could say they don't mix. Uh, and certainly um, everything, uh, you know, it's very difficult to say because uh, abstract art, by its very nature, wouldn't have very much political capital. Message, right. But on the other hand, the horrible reality is that the birth of abstract art was as aggressively political and social as it could possibly have been, and with, by and large, terrible results for the artist. The society survived it, but most of the artists didn't do so well. Mm. What exactly are you talking about? What, what well, obviously, uh, uh, modern Russian art, right. uh, the, the birth of abstraction, Russian right. constructivism. I mean, there's a cliche. I, I only learned this from Carl Andre. Okay. But comes the revolution, the first ones to go are the artists. Mm -hmm. OK. And were there revolutionary aspects, or call it rebellious aspect, when you started to do these black paintings in the 50s? No, not at all. I mean, that, that's a, another kind of growth that, that makes no sense actually whatsoever. I mean, I would have never even thought about uh, making art if it hadn't been for the attraction and uh, to the energy of uh, American post-war painting. OK. I mean, as simple as that. Yeah, I'm asking the question because some of the works, at least, do have rather political or historical titles. Right. You're but referring, you're, you're, for well, example, to the German history, right? Well, there's some, and, and, and now they, they come up. But they certainly didn't come up for over 25 years. Nobody ever Recognized paid one it. tiny uh, iota of attention to it. Please, to, to tell the titles, me, yes. please tell me a little bit about these titles. What, where do they come from? What are they? Well, there's a, uh, they're, they're pretty well documented in uh, Brenda Richardson's uh, 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 catalog about uh, the early paintings, basically the black paintings. And that catalog appeared in. Uh, I don't know, 1973 or 74, which was you know nearly 15 years after they happened, and uh, and her basic thesis thesis was that uh, uh, the paintings were um, a kind of typical portrait of the artist as a young man, 
and in her view, it was a, a reflection of depression, uh, so that the titles were all downbeat. And unfortunately, that was the word that I used myself. But I mean, in a, <laughs> but in a uh, you know not so heavy way. Yeah, but one title is Arbeit macht frei. Yeah, and I knew I would come here to suffer under that. <laughs> <laughs> but the original title of the painting was The Sacred Heart um, in this cross painting. And uh, inevitably, you know, I came across about Mark Fry and to a young man and uh, from, the, from a little bit below looking up the irony and the grimness of the title is, uh, um, you know, hard to, uh, it's very hard to ignore. And there's a kind of horrible sense of self in which you feel sorry for yourself. And, uh, uh, you know, you've been told by your parents all your life that, uh, you know, hard work will, will save you. Okay. And we certainly know that that's not true. Okay. <laughs> And the other one, I, I'm thinking. But of, I can is add to that. I'm as well. Is the yeah. Lied, a song? yeah, yeah. But anyway, I finished with about my friend. I'm as well. Okay. Let it hang out, as they say. And I, I realized that uh, at a certain point, uh, it, you know, it's not quite my business, as they say, uh, because when I met a survivor and uh, we, we saw the painting, she said, "Well, how do I know which side you're on?" And uh, she was dead right, right, and I was dead wrong. All right. When you started doing these very black paintings, which are actually not really black, they are black and white in a way, right? Yes, there's some flicker yeah. of hope there. Was that, was that something yeah, that was bra an act of braveness? Or what what, what no. made you do these works? It's After really, I mean, it's, 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 so, it's so impossibly simple and ordinary, and it's, a, uh, it's an absolute act uh, that almost every painter follows. And uh, almost every painting reaches a point at which you don't like it and you paint it out. Okay. Okay. And this was simply an act of painting out a painting that I had been working on. And I so painted it, it out with disgust. the black paint. Yes, yes. Well, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you're finished with it, you don't, and you paint it out. So I painted it out in black. And unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, uh, when I saw it the next day, uh, I had painted it out, but it didn't seem so bad. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so it seemed to have that there was a kind of possibility in something uh, being completely overpainted. And uh, so uh, I, I went on, uh, I just started to think about it. And uh, I began to make drawings and things and start to think about just doing it that way rather than make something and then paint it black on top of it. Might as well start with the black to begin with, and you spend a lot less time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and were you probably were aware of the fact that, uh, for example, Robert Rauschenberg already had done these kind of. I, black I was well, actually well aware of that. Um, um, Eleanor Ward, who owned a gallery in New York called the Stable Gallery, uh, where Robert Rauschenberg uh, worked as a, a janitor, uh, she also uh, elevated him after a few years. Uh, to the position of artist, and she gave him an exhibition. And then when she came to see my work with Emile D'Antonio, uh, I moved around and I showed her all these, you know, black paintings. And the studio was actually smaller than this room. But anyway, I showed them to her, and she said, oh, oh, I, 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 Bob Rauschenberg did that 10 yeah. years ago. And then she got up with D and, and left. And what uh, but think? she almost fell down the stairs. As a, <laughs> <laughs> So you were frustrated about that, or what? what no, did, not did at all. Actually, that? I mean, I mean, it, it made, you know, I mean, why? What did I care? I mean, um, no, it had nothing to do with anything that Bob Rauschenberg had painted black paintings, which I knew perfectly mm. well. Um, there are a lot of, there. I mean, these paintings were so much like, uh, probably they were in a certain way. They were less like Bob Rauschenberg than they were like. Uh, say, uh, Newman and uh, Rothko and uh, uh, the paintings that are, uh, painters that I like. Mm -hmm. um, but you didn't really sell many of them, right? I think you that sold also one. That also is not exactly, one, right? I don't know, not, that's not exactly true. Okay. I always sold paintings uh, from the time I was 15 or 16 years old. It's just that the amount for which I sold them was not staggering. <laughs> <laughs> You actually started to sell paintings when you were 15? 
Yes, yeah, yeah. To whom did you sell them? Well, I sold them to my teachers, to friends of my <laughs> teachers, and, and to whomever was interested. And my father was always uh, uh, trying to sell my paintings to his friends or acquaintances or whatever. He was always promoting me. And this black painting, what, what, what did it cost back then? Well, um, it, uh, it's a little hard to remember. I'm s I, wish my, I wish I could I be quicker. I think it was $1,000 or something? No, no, no. Well, 800. Uh, well, the first ones were sold for $75. Okay. And, um, but uh, Thomas Hoving was brought uh, who was the head of the Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art. And uh, I came from Princeton, and uh, some of my instructors and everything were friends, were art historians. And they brought Hoving uh, to my studio. And he came, and I, again, did the same thing I did for Ellen Ward. I paraded them around, and I held them out and this, that. And then he said, oh, I, I like that one. That, that's pretty nice. And he said that he would let me know uh, the next day uh, about it, and he asked for the price, which I quoted at $75. And then he called me back, and he said he had uh, uh, just talked to it, uh, uh, talked about it with his wife. And they, since he was a graduate student at Princeton University, planning to come to New York. By the way, Hoving was the heir to. Um, anyway, we won't we won't <laughs> go into that. <laughs> a jewelry company on, on Fifth Avenue. Anyway, he, he said that uh, he felt that he and his wife talked it over, and since they were making such a large uh, commitment in their new work uh, and in their new life moving to New York City that they didn't feel that they really could afford that much for a painting <laughs> when they moved to New York. Yeah. All you're saying it sounds to me that you're a very self-conscious man when you, when you started working in New York. No more self-conscious than any other artist who was working in New York. I mean, they all had the same problem. They had to sell paintings and they had to uh, continue to work. How many and galleries were there in New York back then? Not so many. I mean, it depends. I mean, certainly there weren't very many galleries that would be interested in my painting. On the other hand, um, a perfectly decent gallery, the Tibor de Nagy Gallery, um, I used to go around to the galleries. And uh, um, when I ra went around to Tibor's gallery, it was a, a run by a, a, a kind of really interesting guy named Johnny Myers. And when I came in the gallery, he was on the telephone explaining to someone that, uh, yes, uh, it was possible to buy a Larry Rivers painting or a Grace Harding, but it was really difficult for him right now because, of course, the <clears throat> they were in the Hamptons and the summer was their work period, and he wasn't sure what they'd actually worked on. <laughs> 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 so he had to wait until the paintings came in from the Hamptons before he could really seriously discuss with them the possibilities of buying a painting. And uh, then I talked with him a little bit, and he, he knew about me. Again, from Bob, all of the people that I met really were uh, largely through Bobby Rosenblum, uh, who was a, a teacher at the time, and, uh, and then became a teacher at uh, NYU Fine Art. <laughs> and, uh, and we talked, and he said, OK, uh, Bob, oh, I call him Bobby. I mean, I, I can't say it any other way. Anyway, Bobby said that you had some paintings that were interesting, and, and why don't you, I'm having a group show and I'm showing a, another artist, Edward Avedisian. I'm showing young artists. Why don't you send a painting up? And I said, fine. And uh, a couple of days later, um, a guy bangs on my studio door. A very kind of gruff big guy. It's Al Hell. I know who he is and everything. So he's there, and he says, hey, I got to bring this painting up to Johnny Myers. And uh, I look outside, and I see well, this is the smallest painting I have, and it's seven by five feet. He says, that's not going to fit in my station wagon. <laughs> so he takes the piece, we bring it downstairs, and he straps it on the top of the station wagon. <laughs> and, and, dra and it's raining besides, actually. <laughs> and, he, and he takes it up to, uh, mm. to Johnny Meyer's gallery, and he puts it in the group show. And I mean, that's sort of how it went. It didn't actually end very well either, because um, <laughs> He put it in the racks, and then most of you won't know Edward Avedisian. He's, he's not with us, as they say, anymore. But he made these kind of interesting, really thick globs of paint. And my painting came back black with a lot of cadmium yellow smears over it, oh. which I didn't really appreciate. 
So was it a very competitive atmosphere back then? Uh, it's always said that there, it's a ra rather small art scene in the 50s. Every, everybody knew everyone. You know, it's true. It was small, and everybody did know everybody, and it was very competitive. But, you know, you have to experience it. I hate to use athletic uh, metaphor, uh, well, kind of ideas and everything. But, you know, it's true it's competitive in every way, but it's, uh, it's competitive among people that are playing the game. Okay. And they're all quite confident, and they know how to play. So when you're playing with your equals, and your peers, you know, you don't worry about it too much. You just keep playing and mind your own business mm -hmm. and do the best you can. But there were all these heroes around. Is that something that you that Yeah, you everybody, you? Uh, yeah. All of the young artists, uh, the artists that were, most of them were a tiny bit older than I was, but, all, but, but Larry Poons, of course, was younger. And, and actually, at that time, uh, Roy Lichtenstein, although he was really older, was considered a very young artist. So, I mean, uh, Rosenquist, I mean, everyone looked up to the abstract expressionist artist, no matter how, it's just a question of which one you looked up to. And uh, it was pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. And actually, the thing about the galleries, I have, I have to admit, you know, most of the artists that I knew and, and uh, the younger artists, they're really only a, a small number of galleries that counted. I mean, there are a lot of galleries, but you wouldn't, didn't want to show with them anyway. I mean, that wasn't the point. Mm -hmm. And you ended up at Leo Castelli's. Yes, yeah, I did. <laughs> so you actually you were very successful in a very young age. You, were, you had a show actually at, at MoMA with 33, I think, a retrospective, the first retrospective. Yeah, but was any it? artist in New York who was young, I mean, it was a good time to be young, actually. Again, everything is about, <laughs> it, everything is about opportunity because the abstract artists had worked so hard and were finally really established during the 50s. And so we benefited the younger artists, were younger, were the youngest artists uh, benefited from the younger artists. And the younger artists at that time wouldn't, would have been uh, Al Held, and they would have been Ellsworth Kelly, uh, Sam Francis. I mean, basically, it was the artists of the, uh, uh, they were the second generation artists, Michael Goldberg, Al Leslie. And so these artists, a lot of whom uh, went back to Europe after the war and the GI Bill and everything, so they even had uh, connections in Europe that are that later, that blossomed actually quite quickly. So we were the third generation of American mm -hmm. artists to be successful, which is another way of saying maybe, you know, you're successful, but maybe you're still low man on the totem pole. Mm -hmm. Okay. But um, doing abstract works of art, is that something you decided, or is it just something that just came along with the working in New York? Or at what point did you, did you well, I was painting, start to yeah. specialize on yeah. that? Well, I was always painting. I mean, when, once I, I, actually I was painting before I even went away to school. My mother was a painter and uh, 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 a student in uh, fashion school, okay. art school. And my father, although he did eventually end up as a gynecologist, was a house painter uh, to house. work his way through school. And so we painted in the house. And it really the difference, the only thing that you say about being an artist is that it's about the material. So for me, uh, paint was always familiar. Okay. So it was. I, I didn't have to learn about uh, cadmium red or tinting colors or black enamel or uh, or you know uh, linseed oil or you know I, it wasn't uh, turpentine. Didn't mean anything to me. <laughs> and were your parents happy that you decided to become an artist? You know, they weren't happy, but they, you know, they really weren't unhappy either. I mean, uh, as they you know. They thought it was uh, okay to have that as a kind of hobby or something like that. My father thought I could be an optometrist, and then I'd still have plenty of time to paint at the end of the day. <laughs> but you didn't follow that course. Um, I would have, uh, but um, it, it didn't work out that way. And the other thing you have to say, I mean, you, you, you uh, glamorize success at a, at a, in a certain kind of way, but the situation, uh, if you're working in a, in a, in a milieu that, 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 that's functional or something like that, the normal thing, even for the successful artists at our time, uh, was to, uh, since the uh, amount of money that you're talking about is, is relatively small and it's expensive for anybody at any time to live in New York City, to function there, uh, it, it, basically most artists were teachers. Mm -hmm. 
and, uh, uh, and so uh, with a teaching job, uh, and then you would uh, work and then have exhibitions in galleries. Mm -hmm. And from my point of view, being in New York, uh, I expected to, to do something like that, although I worked for a while as a house painter, and because teaching jobs weren't really available to me. And, and then I, I actually didn't expect to have an exhibition until something normal, like you know, in your 30s or late 20s or something. Then you'd be around, you'd be on the scene for a while, and if you were able to develop and sustain what you were doing, uh, you'd probably end up with a gallery exhibition. Okay. Why don't we Which just- Which was pretty normal. Yeah, why would you, don't we just jump to the year 2012? Uh, you're still that? working, right? You're still uh, going to the studio every day? I um, don't overdo it, no. I, I, I go <laughs> to the studio. Okay. Um, and your studio is close to your home, or do you have Well, to it was close to my home, but now it's far away. It's far away. So you drive out? Yeah. And is it something important for your daily routine to go there, or is it, what do you do there, actually? It's a good question. Sometimes I do absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I sit and wait for a delivery from Belgium or Germany or something for a piece that we're going to work on. That's I where your works FedEx, are produced. I spent a lot of time talking to FedEx. <laughs> I, I know it's a not a, it's a nasty question, but how, what is creativity to you? I mean, how do, do how do, do, do how do ideas develop in your? Is it, do you have an idea and then you start scribbling on a paper? Or how do um, things come ab come about? Yeah, most things come from what happened before, and so whatever you're working on, whatever it happens to be, uh, begins to run down, and then you get anxious. When it's, when it's losing its momentum. And then you think about, well, I might have to do something else or what would I want to do? And then you, you look at what you've done in a slightly different way from when you started it, when you had an idea of what it should be. And you look at it mostly to see if there's anything that, has, uh, that could develop in a different way from the way you've developed it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, sometimes you get a hint from something like that. And then sometimes you get lucky and it comes totally from the outside. Mm -hmm. For example, these works with the hat. Yes, the, the beach hat, yes. Finding a hat on the beach in uh, Rio, yes. Uh, because the soaker uh, was, all it is is a, a, a version. Hat, what kind of hat was that? It's a, a foam hat, uh, which has a spiral uh, cut out in it with a visor. And you dip the foam, you don't dip it, you drop it in right. the water in the ocean, and then it's wet. You have and the it wet cools water. your head. Yeah, and then you pull it over your head, and the uh, spiral deforms uh, to create sort of a dome on your head. Mm -hmm. And that's an object that you found and that you found interesting for your work. Well, it's interesting because it's just a version of what you do every day in art school, which is uh, uh, to make a, a usually a geometric form or a, a drawing, and then you cut, the, cut along the lines that you draw on the piece of paper, and then you bend and twist that in space. Mm -hmm. And that's all that I did with the foam hat. Uh, but it turned out that twisting a spiral is pretty interesting, or not necessarily interesting, but it, it has a lot of possibilities mm -hmm. if you happen to like the way that looks. Mm -hmm. And you also, just to have another example, you once tried to, to catch the, the, the the cigar s smoke, No, I blew right? smoke rings, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You tried yeah. to find a way to translate this. Very well, it was a, a fantasy point. about uh, blowing the smoke rings, which you can photograph in a complicated way. Anyway, you, can, you could put the, a version of the smoke ring uh, after you have it uh, scanned in, in a volumetric way in computer, say. And the notion was about computers, which was fairly early on, that uh, uh, what they do every day on the Weather Channel or something, you can uh, uh, influence uh, the form that you have by the way uh, uh, you would uh, blow on it, uh, change the temperature, change the direction of the uh, force against it and everything. And I thought that, well, that might be pretty nice because the smoke ring is kind of interesting already in itself. And if you could uh, move it or stretch it or do different things to it, you would create a kind of interesting forms or something that you could work with. And it's a nice idea, but it turns out not to be practical. 
in the sense that smoke rings are made up of particles. And the number of particles in the, uh, in the smoke rings that we scan is still a little bit big for the computers. So they don't, and I don't own, uh, they don't want to waste their time uh, on something like that. <laughs> So that means that uh, it sounds like a p rather playful process, or is it really hard work with crises and mm -hmm. not there aren't too many to crises? But it's not. I mean, I, I know it's a little hard to describe. But my, my attitude, I think, is hardly playful. But <laughs> it's hardly <laughs> even playful? though I can laugh about it. Yeah. But it's what if it's not playful? Uh, well, you know, I'm looking for something. I mean, it's just about inevitably you see and then. Uh, after you see, you start to look, and then if you if you make things and you want to have them uh, kind of to be expressive visually or have a kind of visual impact, you, you, you're stuck with thinking about them and worrying about them. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're always working with your hands, right? It's important for you to create this assemblage with touching material? Well, touching. I mean, I think that all art, um, well, not, I mean, I can't speak for all art, obviously, but I mean, uh, things are visual, and uh, certainly with the early paintings, uh, the stripe paintings and the uh, more severe geometric paintings were about having a, a direct visual impact. So you wanted to kind of imprint the image on your, uh, on, the, on your own vision. And I think that uh, later on, uh, you know, I became interested in, uh, uh, I noticed, although I think it was always there, that important as the visual impact or imprint might be, uh, without some sense of real tactile quality, if you didn't really want to touch it or feel like you could touch it, or even trace the forms with your hands, it was, you know, what people said about abstract art, kind of academic and maybe not that interesting. Okay. So there was a kind of uh, pressure uh, to make the things uh, visual and tactile at the same time. But it's not allowed to touch, unfortunately. Well, I mean, that's not my problem. That's a museum. <laughs> <laughs> you are allowed to touch it, but the visitors aren't, right? Well, OK, th that's possibly true. But in order to, uh, in order to work, uh, uh, the visual imprint isn't that real either. But I mean, it's the sense of it uh, that's important, so that you have to ultimately you know, the search for, OK, what does it mean in the search for feeling? What, what can you feel about it? That's what, that's what is there, uh, mm -hmm. which is the visual imprint and the tactile sense that you can follow it with your hands and you can understand the, uh, uh, the form mm -hmm. and, you start and their relationship. And you start off with a model, right? That you build a model of something? Most of the time, uh, yeah, the, the result is a version of something that, uh, uh, like later on or with the hat, uh, we just cut it out of plastic and then bent plastic, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then after that, uh, decided to model the, the flatter parts of it, uh, which makes it a kind of real topological problem and very expensive. But anyway, that's the path we followed. And then what happens with the model? What happens afterwards? If somebody tries to... The model has to be scanned, and then somebody who's quite clever has to be able to... Um, uh, model the, uh, uh, the leading and following edges like a, a, so that you have a, a curvature uh, over the top and the bottom that's like an airplane wing. And then you have to take that curvature and the leading. It's as though you take an airplane wing and do what you don't want to happen when you're flying and bend it in space. Okay. And that is doing someone in Belgium or in Germany? Or did I get that right? Oh, well, the manufacturing is yes. in uh, 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 Belgium, and, and uh, we have a place in Germany, too. Okay. It's ra it's, I mean, it's what everybody's doing right now, actually. It, uh, it's a, we're, we're talking about uh, three-dimensional printing, rapid prototyping. Right. Is the most difficult part of doing art to decide when it's ready? Well, I don't know about that. It's a, you know, I don't think the... the and the abstract expressionists, you know, when they had their place where they met called the club and everything, they, they, they used to argue a lot about when it was finished, especially mm -hmm. when you're painting like the way they did. <laughs> it's hard to tell. But, no, uh, uh, um, yes, uh, but I think that it is, I don't think it's so hard to tell about when it's finished. Uh, it's hard to tell about uh, when it's overdone or when it's underdone. 
So you might say that finish is somewhere in between, and uh, uh, you hit it sometimes and sometimes you don't. Mm -hmm. I use sometimes uh, see words that we say, well, it was not finished. I realize it now. Uh, I, I see things that, um, like and it's actually it's a, a little bit unfortunate, I mean, to, but um, you see things that you say, oh, I could do that better or I could work on that. But actually, it's, a, it's a, a, an illusion or, or a fallacy. If I were to take any painting that I made from uh, maybe even last year and rework it now, it would be a horrible mess. <laughs> and sort of, and uh, uh, it, a version of that, an everyday version of that is the people who are so naive to believe that if something is wrong with their painting, they should send it to the artist to be restored. And that actually is a very fatal move. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you've experienced that move. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, is it important for you, this whole discussion about is it painting, is it sculpture, is it kind of architecture, <coughs> something, these discussions about genre? Um, no, I mean, it really isn't just because I believe that uh, anybody can do it, as they say. Uh, if we take a kind of uh, middle of the line between, I don't know, Lascaux and today, uh, and we let the middle be imaginatively the Renaissance, uh, the idea of fine arts, painting, sculpture, and architecture is good enough for me. And in the Renaissance, almost everybody who could do one could do the others. So it was never that big a deal. Mm. Did I get uh, that? You yeah. know, I think, you know, uh, any architect, uh, not any, oh, well, anyway, they make paintings, architects. How good they are, that's another matter. But they're, but they're, but they're, they're, they're engaged in the enterprise. Mm -hmm. And I mean, certainly their drawings and uh, sketches and things. I mean, uh, Corbusier painted, you know, almost, you know, daily. Brunelleschi even did this. Yeah, well, then there, and, and there, the yeah, performance and, art and. Mm -hmm, yeah. Well, there was a lot of street art and a lot of uh, uh, painting of, for parades and stuff. There was a lot of ephemeral art even then. But did I get that right that you say painting, sculpture, architecture, and mm -hmm. everything else, photography is not what you would Well, well they call didn't have photography in the Renaissance. Call, so yeah, nobody, well, they had the, maybe the camera or something. Yeah, anyway. would, you, would you call photography art today? I wouldn't, but uh, don't quote me. <laughs> <laughs> Could you explain it a little? Or? No, I'm not a photographer. It's not my business. Uh, no, I don't know. I'm, no, I, it's okay. I, it's not a problem, really, for me. The, the, <laughs> the, but the, the lack of tactility is, is a problem for me. Okay. The, the surface, it's, you know, coming from an abstract painter, to say it's too flat seems kind of funny, but <laughs> it's too flat for me. <laughs> And how about video art? I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, film and video and all of that. I mean, I, you know, I said it a long time ago, and I, I, I think it's true, actually, maybe. But, I, I, um, you know, they should, they're their own thing. So I'm sticking to fine art, and they can have their you know, there should be a video museum and a film museum and everything. Actually, I think one of the big problems is with the museums now uh, uh, is the inclusivity rather than the exclusivity, which means that you have a lot going on. And uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it gets to be more about activity and entertainment than anything else. Mm. So but I don't think I'm right about that. And the, pr the, the example that I would give for how wrong I am would be Alfred Barr, because uh, uh, still uh, uh, the focus or the locus of what art is today is the Museum of Modern Art. And it was Alfred himself who was the champion of uh, Picasso, Matisse, and Miro, uh, the great painting, modern painting of France, and the uh, uh, Russian constructivist painting who brought all modern art uh, to the attention uh, of, uh, in America to the, and to the museum. Uh, and, but he was also the one who, who brought modern design and film and uh, uh, architecture to the mm. museum. So it was always there. Mm. But from the point of view of somebody like me who went to the museum, I didn't bother to go to the films. I went to see the paintings upstairs. Okay. But it's interesting because uh, it's always seemed to me that you are very interested in uh, crossing boundaries, uh, trying to find new uh, divided forms, not being painting, not uh, crossing, mixing, mixing up the typical 
old ideas of what a picture is or what a Yeah, but is. if you go just here in Berlin to the Boda Museum, I mean, uh, and look at uh, most uh, medieval and, and Renaissance sculpture, I mean, by and large, it, it, you know, it's, uh, uh, well, the Renaissance sculpture stopped being so much that way, but by and large, uh, in the beginning sculpture and certainly medieval sculpture was polychrome sculpture mm -hmm. or polychrome relief. And what I do is polychrome sculpture and polychrome relief. Mm -hmm. So I don't see it as being so different. Is old art for you more interesting than the modern art? Talking about the Bode Museum? You always no, talked about your fascination for Caravaggio, for example. Yeah, it's true. Uh, you know, Car but I mean, but Caravaggio, I mean, you know, I like Correggio as much as I like Caravaggio, but nobody would believe that. But anyway, <laughs> um, the point about Caravaggio uh, was, again, something I backed into and wasn't, uh, I wasn't very taken with Caravaggio and it used, I used to find him very annoying, his popularity with the art historians and everything. But, um, you know, uh, time changes your, uh, and experience uh, changes your view. But I mean, I did become interested in the, in the obvious part uh, and actually, you know, it's not my idea. I mean, the literature on Caravaggio has always uh, told the same story that I retell, which is uh, about the uh, projective force of, of the painting. So they interested me in the sense that the paintings uh, had the sense that, uh, that they're of the obvious sense, which is really quite powerful, of not only being real, uh, but coming out towards you. So it, it, it's in the... In, in the parlance of our time, they're, they're in your space. But the interesting thing to me was the reality of the, of the pieces, which is normally abstract art uh, is seen as being here and realistic art there, mm -hmm. and that they're, that they're really different. And, and, and that is true. I mean, there, there's nothing wrong with that. But my experience of Caravaggio, actually, of the realism or the reality in Caravaggio was, yes, it was very real and it was very there and very present and incredibly powerful. But what I was interested in was how it got to be that way. And the reality was that it got to be that way because Caravaggio was interested in making paintings. <laughs> and uh, so that, it, that made it clear to me anyway, in one way, that as far as whether it is a painting about St. Sebastian or whether it's a painting about a triangle, it's the same. You have to have, it's making a painting and uh, applying the, what's necessary to make it convincing. Mm -hmm. Is it something that you envy that someone like Caravaggio can do? These painterly, painterly abilities? No, I don't, I don't envy anything. I admire his commitment to painting, uh, okay. to making a pictorial statement, uh, okay. to wanting to uh, make uh, something uh, that's not real, uh, real. Mm -hmm. I'm asking because have you ever thought about becoming more more realistic or naturalistic or whatever you would call it, uh, not sticking to the abstract, but trying to, to paint a portrait of your wife, for example. Well, I don't want to embarrass you. <laughs> 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 um, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't think it's a, a, a question that, that goes somehow anywhere to the point. I mean, the, the point is to make it, uh, you know, is to make it convincing and real as an experience, as a mm -hmm. visual, tactile experience. I mean, it's about, and, and to have it at another level, which is very difficult to measure, and we never know the answer to it. At, at what level is it art? And uh, uh, that's, that's always the issue. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't really have anything to do uh, with, uh, uh, it's, it, it's functional, it's not about what you represent, mm -hmm. it's what you, about what you can make and what you do. So what, what you call art then, is, is it an art question? Could well, I don't have to call it anything because I strive to make it. <laughs> and so <coughs> it's, not, it's not my problem. Mm. No, I can see that uh, you have to, do, to deal with other artists too, you have to work in the art world, so it's, it's not really unimportant to know what art is and what qualities art has. Well, I, I don't think I have a, you know, it's a cliche again, the, probably the oldest one is, you know, I know it when I see it. Okay. And uh, um, uh, 
in my, I, I live in a house that has enough room to hang paintings, and they're all paintings by other artists. Uh, I don't want to come home from work and have to look at my own work. So, uh, <laughs> you're <laughs> so you're also a collector. Yes, yeah, but I'm a, I'm a typical collector in the sense that uh, um, I've only been able to collect as much as I can hang in my house. Okay. May I, I, although I do have a little bit in storage, but yeah. I don't enjoy that. May I ask what you are collecting, what you're collecting? Well, I have a pretty good collection, as you might expect, of art from the 60s and 70s. <laughs> the art I grew up with. Mm -hmm. So are you still buying art today? Hmm. Well, I read a novel last week. I, I mean, I, can't, I, I, I do buy art. I mean, I, don't, I can't think of the last piece that I bought, but I, I, I bought art within the last five years, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And actually, I, I bid on art, too, but I didn't get it. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I might have had more art if I'd been a more successful bidder, I guess. Is, I'm too cheap. is there an artwork that you really would like to have and uh, which is hanging in one museum or it's just not too no, expensive? No, I actually have acquired an artwork that, that I like and uh, that um, um, I have a, a, a Hans Hoffman painting. Mm -hmm. And uh, not so recently, but I acquired another Hans Hoffman. So I have two Hans Hoffman paintings. And if someone gave you a Raphael, for example, you would deny or? No, no. Why, why would I do that? I, I mean, don't I, I don't think I could afford a Raphael. Okay. <laughs> Nor do I think anyone would have one to offer no. me because they have a hard time finding one. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't believe them if they offered it to me. Let's put it that way. <laughs> you once said that there, for you there's no progress in art. That it's not about <laughs> developing new styles, new forms of art, that there's no uprising line. Isn't that the central idea of modernism, that it's developing, that it's always the new that counts? Look, it must be linked in some way, but I mean, this is probably a very poor analogy, but, um, uh, you know, ev take evolution. I mean, how much better are we now than when we started? I mean, it's a long time, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and to gauge the improvement gets sort of tricky to, since the uh, the length of time is so great. Mm -hmm. I mean, from Lascaux to, uh, um, to today, I mean, the, it, it's not better art than the art that was in the caves mm. by any imagination. You really think so? Well, I've seen it, and my experience has been as, as good as anything I've seen since then. Yeah. <laughs> and your skepticism at that point, is that something that allows you to, to also develop new ideas, to de develop new sets of forms, that you're not restricted to one style, that you always try to, I don't know how to call it, invent yourself new? Yeah, that's a really unpleasant cliche somehow. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't feel it that way. And okay. I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't think it is that way. I mean, I, I think that you, you have some sense of what you're doing and uh, what you want, I mean, uh, as, as, you, as you develop or as you do things. And one thing, just obviously leads to another. And uh, um, okay. I think that it's possible that you could say that, uh, uh, you know, people like to talk about creativity and development and sensibility and all those things. And, you know, I think that probably in some way I, uh, I would suppress that fairly much and try to stay focused on what I'm doing. And uh, uh, I don't, what I feel is that uh, perhaps I, I don't really, <laughs> I only feel about how good what I'm doing is, not anything about those don't seem to relate to my feelings. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I don't feel that much connection uh, to what I do, to the life of my work, uh, to the, the life that I live. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you very much. I'm now yeah. wanting to ask you if you have questions for Frank Zell. I think there's a microphone, right? Yeah. <coughs> Thanks a lot for your refreshing remarks about art. And um, you talked a little bit about uh, critics and uh, no, you didn't, talk, you didn't talk about critics at all. You talked about dealers and a little bit about curators. But I was wondering uh, what was the importance of critics in your artistic career? What was the importance, for example, of Barbara Rose. Well, I married her, but that was a fatal mistake. 
<laughs> but did because she was but a she wrote about you. Okay. <laughs> Which I've atoned for since. <laughs> How long did the marriage last? Uh, what was the the play? What was it? The seven year itch. Okay. Yeah. Another question. But I can talk about criticism. Actually, but you framed it in the wrong way. I mean, I think. <laughs> needless to say, I mean, um, it's true. I mean, uh, I won't say what I think about Barbara's criticism, but I mean, uh, but Barbara was one of a whole generation of critics, like uh, my friend Michael Fried and uh, uh, and uh, uh, Donald Judd. I mean, few remember that Donald was a critic, uh, and uh, and and a very important one and a very good one actually, uh, and uh, Philip Leader who. Had, uh, was the editor of Art Forum. I mean, it was a very, and again, when we were discussing the art world and everything, how concentrated it was. And in fact, it was concentrated. And if uh, Philip put a, a, a piece um, on the cover of uh, Art Forum, uh, there were competitive magazines, Art News, Art in America, da 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 da, uh, and Art International actually was quite good. But when uh, Philip Leader put a guy from I call him a guy, but he's really an artist. And I, uh, but no one had ever heard of him before. Barry LeVay from uh, Minneapolis. And he put a scatter piece, a bunch of marbles uh, on a floor on the cover of Art Forum. Uh, you know, that was it. Uh, you know, that might be one of the beginnings <laughs> of installation art. The marbles never stopped rolling after that. So these magazines and these ideas had uh, quite, a, quite an impact. And it could be positive and it could be negative. I mean, uh, I had a dealer. Uh, and when, um, again, when Phil put, uh, um, oh my god, uh, I, should, I better stop now. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, when something that dealers didn't like uh, appeared on the cover of the magazine, they would howl and scream and everything and say, how could they possibly do that? How terrible that is. That's an artist that I don't represent. So that was one level of criticism. And then there were the younger critics, and the same thing happens all the time. And there were the senior critics, or older ones, whatever you want to call them, the Harold Rosenbergs, Dory Ashton, uh, and uh, obviously uh, Clement Greenberg, who were influential as, as you know, they, they dictated the you ambience, though, the way it was. You suffered a bit by, you suffered a bit. He wrote something rather nicely about you, right, Clement? I mean, Greenberg, no, he never wrote about me. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, determinedly. <laughs> but, um, but there was the, this whole business. I mean, that that was, uh, but again, because it was small and because it was concentrated, and I think partly because of this business, a little bit about the business of money, there wasn't that much at stake. So it didn't, it, it seemed to function in a slightly different way. Okay. Come on, another question. Uh, I, actually, I'll say one last thing about okay. criticism. I mean, there, there is criticism. There are millions of magazines here and there. There are millions of newspapers and everything. But by and large, uh, as big as the art world is right now, uh, and global as it may be, uh, there's only one real determinant of an artist's career. And uh, uh, well, there are others. But by and large, the straightest way uh, to a successful career is the review in the New York Times. It was then and it still is today. And it doesn't matter what it says either. <laughs> yeah. as, as Sidney Janis famously said, I don't read the reviews, I only measure them. <laughs> I wondered, um, I don't know if you would think about things this way, but if you have any memories of the year 1962, uh, when the first um, shows of pop art, new realism, neo data, whatever you know, the various things it was called. If you have any memories of that year, any well, I, I don't remember it as that year, but um, the gallery um, Leo showed pop artists, but I mean the the the, the determining factor for pop art, uh, American pop art, or New York local pop art, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, was uh, Richard Bellamy, the Green Gallery. Uh, uh, 
And uh, the backer for the Green Gallery was uh, Bob Skull, uh, Robert Skull, who was the taxi baron and a collector. And he was an avid collector of, uh, uh, for, for Leo Castelli, especially of Jasper and Bob Rauschenberg, but mostly Jasper. And, uh, um, and then he gave, uh, he supposedly unknown to everybody, uh, <laughs> he gave money to support Bellamy's gallery. And it was Bellamy who showed, uh, I think probably Rosenquist first, but certainly uh, Klaus Oldenburg and uh, Rosenquist. And he also showed Larry Poons. And he, even, he showed Don Judd first, too, uh, among others. But uh, that gallery uh, was the turning point. And uh, then there came uh, another one, which burst out into land art, which was Virginia Dwan. And then it, it uh, doubled back to Leo uh, with, uh, um, with Roy Lichtenstein. I mean, mind. one of the reasons I asked, I, I was responding to your comment that it seemed like there wasn't as much at stake um, in those days. And it seems when you read um, like that, that early um, symposium on pop art, that Dory Ashton, Leo Steinberg, that group, mm -hmm. at moment was just electrifying. And, and it was really, I mean, people were at, e at each other's throats. And, um, yeah, they and didn't like each other. I mean, they didn't like the artist either, but I yeah. mean, they were more worried about each other. And I just wonder whether the you remember feeling that. In, at that moment, where the, where, the, where there really was a moment where something was really happening that was kind of scary to a lot of people. And well, I, I, you know, it, it's you know, it's hard when you're uh, young not to be impressed by what's in print. As you get older, you can't read the print that well anyway, so you're less <laughs> <laughs> you're less affected by it. But anyway, it was. I'm, I'm not. A, I'm sorry. I'm missing the question. I, I guess the point of the question. The atmosphere in this years. Yeah, the atmosphere was, um, you know, just basically tolerant because everybody was uh, active enough and involved in what they were doing and confident enough and interested enough in what the people around them were doing so that they didn't, they didn't much worry. Was Warhol someone who impressed you back then? Do you remember that? You saw well, in 62? yes. I, I mean, I, I, I knew Andy actually a little bit. And when I wasn't doing so well, he bought six of my paintings for $50 each. So I got to, <laughs> he paid $300 cash for a group of paintings. So, I mean, he was, that's the way it was. I mean, people bought each other's paintings and things changed hands. It wasn't, um, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't uh, a very big deal. I mean, by the end of the 60s and stuff, you know, it started to get, I guess you could say, out of hand or whatever you want to say. It, it became something else. But for five or six years, when the, the work was concentrated and probably the better work that we produced, uh, the, the, wasn't, the, the social distractions and everything weren't, didn't significantly, significantly influence what the artists made. In other words, neither the critics nor the collectors nor the dealers had much to say about what actually got made. A typical artist would have said at that time, uh, as many did to dealers who said, I think you should do this. And the artist would always say, well, if you know what to do, go ahead and do it. Nobody's <laughs> stopping you. <laughs> well, if there is another question, there is one. Two even. Um, I wanted to ask, what was the role of color after the black paintings, like especially neon color you are still using now? Okay, I, I missed the first part of it. Co it was that color. What was the role of color yeah, after I the you black color? And I didn't remember who she was. But anyway. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, um, there, a lot of the paints that I used were uh, basically cheap paints. So I never had a, a particular attachment to uh, what were called artist colors, partly because they were expensive and everything like that. But I also had a sense of, and I, and I must have got it from the talk and the, uh, the, the idea uh, about Pollock and the use of uh, duco enamel and uh, uh, um, aluminum paint, which was a, quite a small part of actually of his painting. But the idea of it you know, stuck in my mind. So. Uh, I, I was uh, uh, attracted to the use of enamel paint, which is uh, uh, reflective or gives you a kind of hard surface. 
And part of the idea of that was that the conventional notions about painting are uh, that the space moves back and things are absorbed. And it was a, just an idea to make the painting quote unquote flatter by bringing it more to the surface, which the paint, uh, metallic paints nat did naturally. So that, that wasn't a problem. And the notion of color actually um, is not, um, you know, I could say they're all the same to me. I mean, they're colors. And uh, you use them in the way that they work or you seem to need them or something. And fluorescent colors were attractive because they were, as it were, something new and something a little bit different and something uh, like the metallic paints that I was using. And I hadn't thought of it in actually until recently when uh, they started showing some of the older paintings again. But uh, you could say that uh, the, the early paintings, the early stripe paintings, were uh, about just being industrial strength paintings. That was the idea that they didn't give or slip or something. They were out there in the way that uh, uh, something industrial might be. Eine Frage gibt es dort noch und noch hier. Oder? Vielleicht ist niemand noch nicht, oder? He's not allowed. He's yeah, not allowed. please. Uh, Frank, perhaps yeah. you can tell us about the installation in Wolfsburg. Is it that the largest Where? in Wolfsburg? Uh, I would like. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot it or not. <laughs> no. Yeah. Have you ever had such a chance to install your own work in, 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 in a space in the architecture together with the, to, to develop the architecture? Uh, well, it, it's not, what we develop is not architecture. I mean, we, we create basically spaces to exhibit the, the paintings. Uh, the architecture is given, which is the, the container that we work in. And uh, it, Wolfsburg was a, a really happy, uh, happy place because it, it's big enough. Uh, I really believed it was probably too big, but I tried not to worry about that. But it's big enough so that it doesn't have uh, constraints. In most places, uh, you run into a corner or an exit sign, or you can't go here or you can't go there, or the stairway, or this or that. And uh, you're pretty much, uh, in Wolfsburg, there's enough room, and, and the light is fantastically good, so that uh, you can lay the things out in uh, um, maybe uh, something like uh, you could achieve, but uh, it's a kind of goal that you could have. Uh, like Leger, La Grande Parade, and uh, uh, it would, you know, it, it might work. And so I it's think the it best just, retrospective ever, I suppose. Oh, right, 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 right. right. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you feel when you sell your art, and are there certain things you wouldn't, you wouldn't sell? Yeah, that dream on. I <laughs> 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 uh, no. Um, the only things that I have uh, by default, uh, they, it's simply what didn't get sold. Uh, you know, I'm an, uh, I make art uh, in order that I can make art, and I'm able to make art because I sell the art that I make. I don't want to be in the warehouse business. <laughs> no, no, I see things um, actually that I'd like to have, but usually they're things I can't afford anymore, so I don't, I don't. Right, right, yes, that's true. Okay. <laughs> Frank Stella, thank you very much for thank you. being here. Oh, uh.